Early on, we began to add GIS functions to the online library. Uh, the EKI group I worked with oh, eight years ago, they helped me to start this. This required georeferencing the map. So just, uh, many of you know what that is, but just in case, uh, here's the Lewis and Clark map I showed earlier. We georeference it, twist it, turn it, bring it into modern coordinates. Then we're able to overlay uh, modern or any uh, information layers on top of it. In this case, a map of the United States showing state boundaries, roads, and major cities. Or we can bring in data layers. Uh, these are all of Lewis and Cl Clark's campsites. The yellow dots can be clicked on, and you can find uh, latitude and longitude of where they camped and notes on what they did. We then are able to take that georeferenced map and open it in a, in a virtual globe, like ESRI's Arc globe, do transparency against the modern satellite view, tilt it, see it in a global context, how it wraps the area, and also, again, combine it with other layers like the NASA layer, the world at night, and see how the area they traversed has settled up so amazingly in the ensuing years. We were determined to bring the GIS into the public sphere, so we first uh, worked with Arc IMS software, where uh, we modified it with a image viewer and a quad viewer, and we created various sets of uh, urban historical maps. This one of San Francisco. Four maps we'll look at in that uh, milieu. San Francisco, 1890, 1869, 1859, and 1915. These are all georeferenced. All these maps are drastically different sizes. But in the quad viewer, they're all the same size and scale, and they move together as we zoom into the area around South Beach. And we can see change quite clearly uh, over time. You can change any of the windows into uh, any other layers that you want. At the same time, we built a very simple transparency image viewer. Here is this map, 1869, of the North Beach, north coast of San Francisco. We can blend in the modern satellite view and see how the coves have filled in over time, or swipe the same view. The application also offers very uh, robust GIS tools, actually more robust than in Google Earth, although as I'll show you Google Earth is moving in that direction. We then, but this limited us, we did about 200 maps in, in this series of work. We then collaborated with EKI and did 10,000 maps in a rough georeferencing of just the four corners. There's other maps that I showed you and the ones that I'll show you in Google Earth that we do like 50 or 60 points to really get the maps well aligned. In EKI, uh, you can search for the maps. It's in their metadata clearinghouse. These are maps of South America. It's a rough georeferencing, but still a very valuable tool. Our next exploration was the creation of a 3D GIS, working with this map of Yosemite Valley, which I showed you earlier in Second Life from 1883. In that time, it was a marvelous map, the first accurate mapping of Yosemite Valley. They showed the steep cliffs with uh, a cartographic convention called Hesuri. We georeferenced the map shown here, combined it with a modern digital elevation model from the USGS. This little animation shows how we stretch the map give a sense of depth. Then using early gaming software and something called Virtual, we were able to create a, a public viewable site with a simple plugin. This is a little flash preview of it. And here is um, a view of it in the plugin. You can see the map now in three dimensions. I, did, I actually showed this work at DLF seven years ago, this particular 3D view. You can turn it, twist it, and uh, it has underlying it a modern USGS map. And then just uh, next month, actually, this will be coming in Google Earth. This now gives us everything that we had in that viewer, but now we can see the map in the Sierra Nevada mountains in full 3D in a, in a much larger sense of context. That's what Google Earth offers. It shows where everything fits. We can do transparency. We can zoom into the map, fly through it, 
And as I'll show, Google Earth offers the basically unlimited ability to work with maps of different scales and projections. And then finally, here in Second Life, we took a major portion of that whole Yosemite map and laid it out over four sims, 512 meters by 512 meters. So the scale feels gigantic now. It's, it's not your one-to-one -one map, but it's, it's getting closer. So it's a whole other kind of feel for the map that happens in Second Life. We take advantage of the draw distance of 512 uh, meters so that you can see the whole map uh, laid out. Google Earth is the ultimate context machine for my historical maps and that it can place them in time and scale right on the Earth as these examples show. So in late 2006, I, as I mentioned earlier, I created a public historical map layer in Google Earth, which is now in the gallery layer, Rumsey Historical Maps, with 16 historical maps. And we'll be adding another 100. Uh, they're actually online now, but they're tweaking them in uh, early May. This allows for all the tools of Google Earth and its growing layer of content to be seen with the historical maps and explored in various ways. So here's our 1853 map of San Francisco in Google Earth with the built city shown in black polygons. That was the way they did it in those days. You can turn on the Google Earth three-dimensional layer of the built city today and compare the two. Here's a map of Africa, maybe of interest to Joel, from 17. 87, a map of Tokyo from 1680, three maps of islands in the Caribbean from 1775, Seattle, 1890, maps of Europe from the 18th century, a map of Lima, Peru from the 1860s, a map of, of Kyoto in the foreground and Osaka in the background, both uh, from the 18th century a map of Tokyo, finally, from the 19th century. These, uh, this library will be accessed through these symbols in Google Earth. You will click on any of these symbols, and it will open up the maps uh, and display it. Google Earth hosts all kinds of information layers from worldwide sources. Here we see our 1836 map of New York City. We can turn in Google Earth, we can turn on their street map layer, their 3D building layer, their Wikipedia layer, even Google Book searches now in Google Earth. Google community creates endless amounts of interesting information. This is all user created. Tourist information, even YouTube. Not particularly relevant to historical maps, but sometimes interesting. And panoramio layers, census information, and then, of course, other historical maps can be blended in. You can even do, as I said, beginning simple GIS in Google Earth. Here we measure the perimeter of New York City in 1836 of the island. It was 17.71. Uh, sorry, 26.64 miles and 17.71 square miles. Compare that to the city today, and you can see again, typically with these urban areas, how the coastline fills in. To give a sense of the rapid growth, just since I started working with them a year and a half ago, these are just some of the layers that are in the gallery layer and the global awareness layer. They must be approaching at least 50 layers of in their own server. They are also, if you look at their KML gallery, there are now hundreds of externally hosted layers. So this Google Earth is really becoming a major geospatial library of information, and not just uh, geospatial information. There's a Jane Austen layer that just launched in the KML gallery. <laughs> There's lots of humanities information that has geospatial aspects. Um, I'm working with the Smithsonian American Art Museum uh, helping them put 40,000 outdoor sculptures in North America in Google Earth with points on where they all are, linking to pictures, and so on. Google Earth even has the daily clouds now, 
This is clouds from November of 2007, sort of whimsically laid over Henry Popple's map from 1733.